Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our panel, Accessibility at Scale, Digital Inclusion in Large Cultural Heritage Organizations. Ensuring that our websites, mobile applications, and digital content can be easily navigated and understood by a wide range of users, including those with visual, auditory, motor, or cognitive disabilities is of utmost importance in our GLAM institutions. But figuring out the best path to accomplish this, particularly given limited resources, tools, and staff trained in inclusive and accessible design can be increasingly challenging. So today, we're going to discuss the what, why, and how of providing digital accessibility. What do we mean by it? How, what is the importance of addressing digital and web accessibility as fully as possible on digital platforms? And how can we develop digital and web accessibility plans and strategies across institutions? Before we dive in though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we have the privilege of speaking with all of you today from the Washington DC area, the traditional territory of the Piscataway and the Nakachunk peoples, as well as from Cary, North Carolina, the traditional territory of the Lumbee and the Tuscarora. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people who call these lands home and whose collections we steward and interact with across our cultural heritage organizations. I'm Caitlin Haynes. I'm a cis white woman in my mid thirties with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a green shirt and I have glasses on. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I am the program manager for the Smithsonian Transcription Center here at the Smithsonian Institution and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Joining us today are three incredibly knowledgeable professionals working in digital accessibility and inclusivity within and across the museum field. Sina Baram is the founder and president of the inclusive design firm Prime Access Consulting Inc, or PAC. Rochelle Bradley Montgomery is a digital accessibility specialist at the Library of Congress. And last but certainly not least is Wendy Stangle, chief uh, Section Chief for Accessibility and User Research at the Library of Congress. Thank you, Sina, Rochelle, and Wendy for sharing your expertise with us today. I will turn it over to you all to share a little bit more about yourselves with our audience. Uh, Sina? Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm a light-skinned, uh, uh, mid-30s man of um, a Persian descent. Uh, there's a, a, a baby grand piano that you can see in my uh, background, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Cary, North Carolina. I'm the president of Prime Access Consulting, PAC. We're an inclusive design firm that does a lot of work in digital and physical spaces. Think anything from augmented reality to websites, holograms, projection mapping, all the way over to helping to build museums from the ground up and including accessibility and inclusive design methodologies into that project, into those processes, be it a capital project or uh, any specific uh, initiatives at museums in order to welcome the widest possible audience uh, to our institutions. Uh, my background is computer science and I do happen to be blind, so I'm a screen reader user and that lived experience influences my work. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Sina. I'm going to hand it over to you, Rochelle. Hello, it is a pleasure to be with everyone. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman with gray hair. I have been working in usability and accessibility for over 20 years at this point. I'm currently a co-chair of the W3C Accessibility Guidelines Working Group. I was previously a co-facilitator of the Cognitive and Learning Disabilities Task Force, and it is again a joy to be here. Thank you, Rochelle um, and Wendy. Hi, I'm Wendy Stengel. I am a middle-aged white woman with big glasses, about shoulder length brown hair and a facial scar. And I've been with the Library of Congress for almost five years now, working on content accessibility, user research. And I have spent my entire career trying to get people to the answers they need to do the tasks they need to perform in digital spaces and print spaces. I'm very happy to be here. And if you caught my computer tumbling earlier, then you already met my cat. We love having pets uh, join us on Zoom. So the more the merrier, everybody. Um, thank you all for that. So let's dive into today's, to dis today's discussion because we have a lot that we wanna cover. Um, so we're gonna divide today's sort of chat. This is gonna be kind of informal, nice discussion hearing from everybody. And we're gonna focus on three specific topics. 
um, policies, contracts, and procurement when it comes to accessibility implementation, um, accessibility of digital collections, and assessing and communicating digital inclusion throughout your institution. So let's start with that first topic, policies, contracts, and procurement. So we should all be familiar with federal standards like WCAG 2.0. Um, and for anyone interested, we can dive into that a little bit deeper if we want to, but we're going to kind of go beyond that right now. Um, as large scale cultural heritage organizations create policies and plans, though, and hire vendors to implement accessible design in their digital work, what should they be sure to include in these policies and contracts and procurements and what other kinds of standards should be referenced? Well, I'm going to jump on in here. This is Wendy speaking. and. The Library of Congress is large and has contracts that span years. Also, we are not in the executive branch of the government, we're in the legislative branch. So while revised section 508 is a done deal for, for the executive branch, we have a lot more room for older and newer policies to crop up in our contracts. For us, this means a lot of always making sure we know what the contract itself says before we say this is or is not accessible if we're assessing some product, because something might have only ADA as a requirement and others might have WCAG 2.1 AA as a requirement. I don't think anybody on our team ever thought that we would become contract experts. And I don't want to imply that we are, but we are very good at reading through all of the documentation to find out what we should be talking about with any given project, any given contract, any given procurement at a time. As you can tell by that weird patter in my voice, it's a lot. And so I would recommend if you already have a mismatch of policies going on to try to get people unified behind one standard. If your executive branch, yay, section 508, do that, be strong, be bold. But for us, we are working across the library to adopt standard language that we can put into new procurements that speak to the standards that we think should be there. How does that sound for vague? Um, <laughs> a lot of it comes down to working with and educating our procurement people to make sure they have the right boilerplate language to put in for the right products or services that they're buying. And also working a lot with our business analysts who are doing market research up front to select products that might get procured so that they know what to ask for and how to see if things might actually be complying with the standards we want. Everybody's procurement processes work a little bit different. Everybody's contracts are going to look a little bit different, but working with the people in your organization who create and maintain and support those contracts so that you have everything you need to then assure that things are as accessible as possible is vital. Uh, working on those relationships just pays dividends for years to come. We have more and more people reaching out to us from contracts, wanting to learn more about when to use which phrasing. And I'm going to do my first URL uh, thing right now. Section508.gov, even if you are not trying to hold your products and services to Section 508, is a wonderful site that includes Section508.gov slash buy, B-U-Y. And it has some great language resources so that you can help everybody involved in your procurements uh, understand what is going to be accessible, understand how to put the right language into your um, contracts so that you can hold your vendors to accessible standards and so that you can help educate your entire teams. 
I think I'm like two minutes and don't want to eat up all the space. Who wants to chime in? No, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, I would love to hear, you know, Rochelle, do you have any sort of additional comments about how you guys manage all of this at the Library of Congress? I think actually I'm going to kind of pivot on that a little bit because both you and Wendy talked about the web content accessibility guidelines and it's so important uh, for organizations to pick a standard as, as Wendy mentioned. So WCAG 2.0 A and AA typically are what um, most commonly are used in the U.S. because of Section 508. WCAG 2.1 A and AA are often um, used in Europe, but when you're deciding kind of on which one of those to point to, because those are, are kind of the standards uh, around online content, just do keep in mind that WCAG 2.1 includes mobile. And for all of us, mobile is becoming increasingly important. More and more of our audience uh, addresses mobile content or reaches our content through mobile interfaces. Um, WCAG 2 ICT is another link uh, I might call out and we're happy to provide. Um, it, is, it adapts WCAG to desktop content, so it is something that people aren't always aware of, but can be used to extend the applicability of, of WCAG. Um, if you're kind of, if you have flexibility when creating your standards, I also just want to recommend taking a look at a few additional documents. One is to look at the AAA standards. So again, we tend to go towards the A and AA standards, but the AAA standards really contain a lot of content that supports people with cognitive and learning disabilities. There is an additional document called Making Content Usable for People with Cognitive and Learning Disabilities that provides a lot of great best practices um, to consider and think about. Uh, other, other standards to know about and, and pay attention to is the authoring tools accessibility guidelines. So if you're purchasing uh, an item that's going to let people create content, so something that's actually generating content, taking a look at those, they're very specific, uh, is worth the time as well. Um, and again, around kiosks, which interactive kiosks, uh, those experiences are increasing in cultural heritage institutions. Uh, looking at 707 in the ADA and looking at 402 in Section 508, they're going to provide requirements you can use and integrate into your standards. So just some thoughts on kind of how to extend and, and uh, really get clear requirements when you're creating your procurements or you're creating your policies. That's really helpful. Thank you. And for, for those of you possibly overwhelmed by all of the different abbreviations and acronyms. We are providing links to a lot of these standards um, and everything discussed in the chat. So make sure to check that out. Um, I'm interested to hear, Sina, you know, you work with so many different kinds of organizations um, offering advice and suggestions. Um, what are your thoughts on procurements and budgeting? Yeah, uh, before I get to budgeting, maybe it would be good to address some of the the, the WCAG stuff we've been uh, talking about. I have the, um, we'll go with privilege, of reading about 100 or 200 of these kinds of contracts a year. And so a little, some, some few pieces of advice. Um, if you're interested in accessibility and promoting inclusive design uh, and are not subject to any restrictions, let's be very clear that WCAG 2.1 uh, AA is basically industry best practice, right? Sometimes there are restrictions and you have to comply with 2.0, but I would encourage anybody who's in a position of a starting point or a starting point of crafting language, always start with WCAG 2.1 and AA, there are many processes in place that will push back if they need to. But let's let's definitely strive for the thing that is not you know, 16, 17 years old at this point. Um, WCAG 2.1, is, is not the end all and be all. It is just a set of guidelines as a, to say what goes into deeming a digital experience, um, predominantly websites, but as was mentioned earlier, mobile as well, uh, as accessible. But it's also just a starting point. We also need to make sure that in our contracts, we do have language around best practices that are specific to those things that are being developed. For example, if it's an iPhone application or an Android app, both Google and Apple have accessibility guidelines and best practices that you can point to. Microsoft as well has usability standards that you can point to. What's really critical here is that as an institution and as a client, you are not on the hook for double, triple, and quadruple paying for accessibility, which is so often what happens. We see this time and time again. A vendor will promise to deliver an accessible product. They will not do so. And then the end of the project is left with the client, yourselves, uh, making a 
decision. Do I want this thing delivered on time or do I want accessibility? This is the thing we're trying to avoid by putting into the contracts not only the standards we expect vendors to comply with, but the timeline, the milestones, the touch points and expectations of accessibility intrinsically built into the project schedule and linked against payment milestones. That way, the, the vendor is not making a calculated decision at the end of the project, whether to leave 5% of the contract on the table or deliver on accessibility because it has been woven into the process. This is a really critical point. No matter what standard you, you want to point to, accessibility must be woven into your entire practice. Now, let's talk about procurement. In terms of RFPs, it's important that the RFP itself be accessible. When you're generating that PDF, we need to be walking the talk in terms of accessibility so that we can demand the, uh, that same level of uh, expectation of our partners, of our collaborators, of our vendors, etc. And in terms of budgeting, we want to make sure that we're taking a comprehensive look at budgeting when it comes to accessibility practice within our institutions. If you're in a position to advocate for budget line items for accessibility, it's important to do so, but also to make sure that accessibility is an expectation of other budgetary items so that when value engineering exercises are done, accessibility is not the thing that is reached for and then nixed or axed off of the table. Sometimes there's a danger of lumping a lot of centralized funds into accessibility because then it can be a target for reductions and other types of budgetary exercises. So there's really a hybrid approach that we recommend there to weave accessibility funding like things for captions, audio description, sign language production, web accessibility engineering and uh, evaluations of your websites into individual project budgets, as well as having centralized funds to deal with access needs and accommodations and other things that come up. So those are a few points I wanted to highlight. One thing you said made me think of what we keep going back to. Knowing what your policy is, knowing what your standards are is important but the standard is not the goal. The goal is accessibility. The standard is a tool that helps you know how close you're getting to being more accessible, but accessibility is the goal. It doesn't matter if you can hit everything on a checklist, if people can't use the product or service, it's not meeting its goal. Can't agree more. Really great points, thank you all. Um, and extremely helpful as we're all sort of thinking about how to navigate these uh, these questions at our own institution. Um, I want to transition a little bit to our second topic about digital collections. So um, I know here in the Smithsonian, we're always having you know a lot of pan institutional conversations about how to make websites and online exhibits and interactives, like you guys were talking about in actual physical exhibits, more accessible. But what about digital uh, collections content? So actually digitized, you know, textual documents, audio recordings, videos, etc., either from the archives or produced for events and put into our databases. Can you guys talk a little bit about how organizations can and should be approaching accessibility for those materials? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I think one of the biggest steps you can take as an organization when you start thinking about accessibility of, of what you control, whether it's a website or how we're presenting our digital collections or how we're describing them, is to create some kind of design document. Now that may be a, a actual document, it may be a design system, but making decisions once and then keeping them consistent across the organization, it saves time, it saves effort, and it ensures accessibility. You're no longer trying to decide how, what color scheme you're going to use within a site or within a collection presentation. You know what that is, and all you have to do at that point is really test against your already made decisions. So you're not trying to rework the wheel every single time. So just from an efficiency standpoint, having documented decisions and really thoughtful decisions that ideally incorporate people from across your organization is, is really critical. Um, I'll give you a couple examples um, kind of beyond just color scheme. If uh, you think about collections kind of and how you're going to describe them alt text and and providing alternative text is really a critical part of describing content but there are a lot of decisions you have to make about how you're going to describe even a picture of a person um, are you going to 
uh, describe race, are you going to describe gender? If you don't have those kind of decisions made up front and aren't consistent with them, you have this potential to discriminate by accident because you just des describe it in one place, but you don't describe it in another. And so thinking about controlled vocabularies, thinking about controlled approaches within accessibility and accessible content is, is really important as well. Um, very particular to the space we're working in, uh, um, but similarly, a lot of our collection content has alt text and it has captions and they are slightly different and they play together um, in kind of an interactive way. A lot of times people I think react and say, oh, it has a caption, we can make this decorative. It, especially in collection content, that's not, at least in my opinion, really true because the caption includes factual information and contextual information. The alt text describes what that image actually looks like. And so we, we really parse that out uh, at Library of Congress. And you can check out how we've approached that particular problem on loc.gov. Look at our um, free to use image examples. We have a series of collections available there. And we really are trying to be strategic, um, particularly recently as we kind of evolve our own approaches and design decisions and design documents about how we think about those kinds of problems. And so it might be, it's a great collection anyway, but it might be good uh, to check out. I do again, kind of want to go back to that interactive question and just make sure, you know, interactives, VR experiences, the importance of thinking about those in particular, because even more so than just digital content, um, they're harder to fix because there's this physical interactive portion as well. And so making sure you've got that in that procurement language that you've thought about what you're going to uh, standardize, but also that you're building in time to have people with disabilities come in and test. I think that's so critically important to any of these situations and especially um, any kind of exhibit experience. I think it's just critical to look at. Other thoughts? I'll, I'll jump in with a, a few things there. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I suppose I'll, I'll touch on image descriptions really quick. So um, we have, you know, something called alt text, which is essentially on the web, how a visual description of an image is surfaced technically. And that's what allows, for example, for me, when my screen reader is reading me a website, what gets read out. So basically in 2022, alt text for your images, especially for your collection objects, is the absolute bare minimum that must be done. Because these are, as was said earlier, not decorative, but content. This is the bare minimum that must be done. Um, captions are not alt text and alt text are not captions. That was an excellent point. And I just want to, I want to echo that because that's something that comes up a lot in our work. Um, what a lot of institutions are now starting to do with us, we've had a ton of fun exploring these, are not only visual descriptions, uh, traditionally short ones that get mapped into alt text, but extended visual descriptions and long form visual descriptions. Because remember, alt text is just text. It doesn't support any type of HTML markup or semantics that really are going to be necessary for things like infographics, data visualizations. We're doing projects with NASA, for example. You can imagine the complex amount of information that needs to be conveyed there. So then we have approaches to store and also surface these extended visual descriptions that are not only helpful for a blind audience, right, but that are helpful for all audiences, which really gets us back to not accessibility, but inclusive design. Um, think of someone who's neurodiverse that would benefit from the description of an image, even though they're able to see it, but may for other reasons not be able to uh, get the same understanding of emotional content or something along these lines. Um, along these lines, I just want to give a shout out to the incredible uh, visitors services folks at Cooper Hewitt who have authored, um, I think to date, over 8,200 descriptions in the last 100 weeks. So they just deserve so much uh, applause and, and, and my undying gratitude for their short and long descriptions that they've been written about, the they've been writing on their collections objects. And part of that work is the Coyote Project. So Coyote, spelled like the animal, C-O-Y-O-T-E, and there's a URL, I think, being distributed in the chat, um, is a visual description platform Platform, it's open source where museums and other institutions can have staff from across the organization contribute and write, edit, um, synthesize, review with one another these visual descriptions, be they short ones, long ones, Spanish ones, Chinese ones, sign language ones, so as to uh, formalize these best practices, these controlled vocabularies, and all of those great suggestions that were, were made earlier. And then quickly, and
and lastly on digital interactives in the gallery, not only is it critical, as was pointed out, to test with persons with disabilities, which is such a key thing, but also way before the testing phase to incorporate experts in inclusive design and accessibility, be they in-house experts, external parties, uh, consortiums of people with disabilities, so that during the design phase, you are baking in those considerations that are fractions of fractions of pennies on the dollar to do versus expensive uh, and incredibly um, uh, difficult to retrofit after those in-gallery interactives and touchscreen experiences and things like that have been produced. So just wanted to give a, give, give a couple of shout outs to those points. This is really great. And, you know, I mean, I think this this point that you all are making about being proactive and making sure that you're incorporating accessibility design, accessible design, accessibility concerns um, and opportunities at every step in every part of the process is really important and really useful. I think, you know, I want to sort of touch a little bit and go back to what you were saying, Sina, on, on Coyote and Cooper Hewitt. You're right. We have amazing resources. Thanks. Thank you, Cooper Hewitt, um, uh, that I know we all use across the Smithsonian um, on uh, alt text and image descriptions. Um, but I also know that it can be really daunting and overwhelming from a cultural heritage staff perspective, um, when you have millions and millions of photographs in your collections that may already be digitized and online, you know, thinking about how to sort of go about ensuring that those uh, materials get uh, alt text and image description on them or captions for audio recordings, etc. Um, and Coyote is a really great resource. Do you, any of you want to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe other resources or software that may be available um, to help staff navigate this? Hey, um, we, at the library, we have a project called By the People, which you can get to at crowd.loc.gov. And as you can imagine, we have millions and millions and millions of objects that have never existed in a digital format before now. And when they get digitized, they get digitized as image files. These have some text that a really good computer program can recognize and scrape and extract so that we can use them for various purposes. But we also have lots of handwritten diaries, letters, notes home from the front from the Civil War, handwriting workbooks from the Civil War when they were training right-handed soldiers to write with their left hand because they had had their right hand amputated. There's just a wealth of content that we have and no way to surface that meaningfully until now. With the By the People project, we opened up select collections to volunteers to transcribe and then to have other volunteers proof their transcriptions and clear them to be used for machine learning projects. Eventually we hope to use some of it in our, um, in our catalog descriptions. And we have all sorts of interesting ideas of how this newly machine manipulatable versions of these objects can be used. It's really exciting. It gives everyone a chance to help make our content more accessible and more usable to everyone. And if you ever need anything to do, it's a fun way to spend some time. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, um, I'm a little bit biased here because I do manage our transcription program here at the Smithsonian. Um, but we are, you know, of course, huge fans of Library of Congress's By the People site and work with them often sharing ideas, brainstorming for best practices, um, and working together to ensure that our volunteer communities are getting the best resources and information that they can to help ensure that our collections are more readable and searchable and accessible at both the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. So that's a really excellent point, Wendy. Thank you for that. And then, yeah, everybody sign up for Transcription Center in the Smithsonian as well. Um, and as we all move forward, I know that we're constantly sort of having conversations 
inside and outside and across our institutions about bringing in different sorts of tasks into these crowdsourcing platforms that will allow us to improve accessibility even more broadly um, with things like alt text and image description. And we are, you know, leaning on those resources from Cooper Hewitt to figure out how best to go about that. So that's a really excellent point and really interesting. Um, I want to go ahead and move us on to our third topic here. Um, which is sort of assessing and communicating digital inclusion throughout the institution, um, which I know is is a big one. Um, but kind of how do we go about sort of auditing current policies and practices and how those are being implemented or lack thereof? Um, and sort of what can we how can we use that information to inform sort of pan institutional or pan organizational um, activities and work to ensure that we're getting this right again from the ground up. Um, I want to sort of turn things over to Sina first um, to discuss approaches to this. Yeah, this is this is definitely a big one, right? Uh, in terms of just how to position an entire enterprise, institution, organization, um, in terms of doing better uh, on inclusion and accessibility and not excluding entire swaths of the population. Um, right now, it is unfortunately true that many, many things in the world are born inaccessible. And it is also unfortunately true that a lot of times this is an accepted thing. Oh, well, you know, we, 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 we tried, but, you know, it, it's, it's not accessible. And, and, you know, that's sort of the, the unfortunate reaction, right? So we need to, we need to change the state of affairs uh, because it's not only the wrong thing to do, it also is uh, not the, you know, legal or appropriate thing to do for a variety of reasons. So how do we do that? Well, as an institution, we need both top-down and bottom-up approaches with respect to promulgating best practices uh, across the enterprise. And that means that we need support from senior leadership to normalize and uh, explicitly name the work of access and inclusion. Right. This is not just something that is a checkbox for once a year to be sent out as a perform a letter, nor is it work that should be performative in nature. And so that means that there needs to be initiatives, budgeting, compliance requirements put in place, key performance indicators or KPIs that are updated to measure accessibility. So we know how well or badly we're doing and where to go from here. Uh, lots of organizations, especially, for example, Silicon Valley companies have started doing this and they will start scoring themselves and giving themselves D minuses, you know, on a letter grade scale. And that is OK, because we have to name it, we have to measure it and then we have to get better. So that D becomes a C, becomes a B, becomes an A. Right. And that is a journey and one that requires time. This does not happen overnight, but it also doesn't mean that we should be OK anymore with the lack of progress in terms of accessibility and inclusive design, because unfortunately there is a, a long way to go. Now, there's bottom up approaches as well, and that means lunch and learns with colleagues. That means educating ourselves and our friends and colleagues on accessibility, bringing it up even when the meeting is not about accessibility, because Things like security, things like racial equity, a, a lot of other topics do get that kind of play. Unfortunately, accessibility doesn't as much. And this is something that deeply needs to change because it affects a quarter of the world's population. And over the age of 35, our chances of experiencing a disability are one out of two. So this is not an insignificant portion of our fellow humans. Some good strategies there would be to establish working groups. And it was mentioned earlier, make them be pan-institutional so you can learn from your colleagues and share and disseminate resources like we're doing today, for example, as well as bake these accessibility requirements into the measurements of success and eventually into the measurement of whether or not something gets launched or gets published. If there was 30 typos on the front page, the website would not allowed, would not be allowed to go live. Yet if it's inaccessible, off to, uh, all, all too often it is. This is the state of affairs that we need to change top down policies, standards, guidelines, that sort of thing. And then bottom up through education, practices, working groups, lunch and learns, invited speakers to educate ourselves on the different aspects of inclusion and always striving forward in terms of developing and then performing these best practices as we update our, our practice to be more inclusive and to welcome more people uh, into the offerings that we're creating. 
Awesome. Yeah, it's it's good that we're we're muted and doing this little Brady Bunch trade off with our tiles uh, on video. Here. <laughs> I'm just I'm over here in my office clapping and and jotting down notes furiously because this is extremely helpful. I know to myself, so hopefully to all of you in the audience as well. I'm seeing some great comments coming up too, um, and we're going to make sure that we leave time for questions as well, but we're doing pretty great on time. So good for us guys. Um, Wendy, I uh, want to ask you and Rochelle a little bit about how you guys have gone about sort of auditing and looking broadly and implementing policies at Library of Congress. Wendy, do you mind if I jump in first? Or? I, I was totally going to say, Rochelle, <laughs> talk about that cool maturity model, because that's awesome. <laughs> So we've been working um, to, to measure ourselves and figure out how to improve and what our next steps are using a maturity model exercise. And it's based on um, primarily on something that Level Access created, and I think there'll be a link there called the Digital Accessible, I'm sorry, Digital Accessible Maturity Model. And then we pulled from a couple other maturity models and then adapted it to fit the library situation and, and what we needed. But essentially what we do is we go through nine different categories. So things like ownership and government, uh, governance or policy or training or communications or procurement. And each of those categories is then divided into subtopics. We rate each one based on its maturity from one to five. And, and there's this kind of implied zero where you're doing nothing at all. But if you're doing a maturity model, we assume you're doing something at some point. Um, so from one to five, one's very informal and, and kind of the very basic ad hoc work. Five is optimized where you're, you're not only doing it, but you're contributing back to the community as a whole. Um, and we go through each topic, we rate it, then we average it for each category. And then all of a sudden we have a really great insight into what our current status is for digital accessibility. And the great thing is, each of those maturities has very detailed um, to do's. It's essentially a long to do list. Are you doing this or not? And based on that, that's the maturity you give yourself. So it's really clear what your next steps need to be. If you're not, um, if you don't have senior leadership buy in, and, and Sina, I thought that was a great point, um, then you probably don't have ownership uh, at the level you want. And so that's the next step is to develop and, and work on your senior leadership buy in. So it's been a fabulous exercise. We didn't post our uh, template, but we do have a genericized template. If people would like to have that, I think it's about 49 slides that you work through, but it, it's instructions and an exercise. You are very welcome to email me and I will email that template to you. So uh, we're constantly evolving it, but we're also happy to share it. Wendy? One of the great things about having the model, one is because it's adapted to our particular institutions needs and realities so it's adaptable for all of your institutions needs and realities as well take what is useful to you throw out that which is not add in what you think is needed and if you add in something let us know because it might help mature our maturity model um, but having the maturity model helps us have a common starting point for discussions with people who are not steeping themselves in accessibility thoughts and discussions every day. We can point to the maturity model at a high level and say, you know, we're aiming to be here, say level four. We want the library to be at level four. So we have all of the things that come along with that. And here's the places where we need to really work to make that happen. Um, and if you're talking about making sure that there's training, then you know you need to talk with the people in your HR or your training departments and find out what they're already doing or thinking around accessibility and figure out how you can work that relationship and help them either find content or build content. Um, and it's exciting at the library because once we start having these conversations with one or two people or one or two small groups within a larger group, they tell their colleagues and we start getting people coming to us saying, you worked with these people uh, and talked about these things. We want to do better too. Can you help us do that? So Rochelle especially has been doing a lot of training recently around some things that are 
basic good practices about accessibility, like how you build a document so that when you have a PDF of the document, because we do live in a world where we create a lot of PDFs, you're creating a more accessible PDF right out of the bat, um, right, out of the, right off the bat, right out of the gate. Sports metaphors, I have them. Um, but building a program for a large organization can't just rely on those small group conversations. We do have working groups that are being very helpful to grow a shared understanding of accessibility as an issue and as something we as a library need to live up to. We have a good history of physical space accessibility at the library, and we're working to make sure our digital spaces are as accessible, if not even more accessible, since there's not the place boundedness of physical accessibility needs. Um, for the building at scale, you need to find the people who have the passion and the power, who is going to be able to talk to the next level up of people and get their buy-in or their curiosity or their questions. Who is going to be able to best talk to a recalcitrant person in, I'm, I'm saying contracts, we have lovely people in contracts. I'm sorry, I just said recalcitrant and contracts in the same sentence, but a recalcitrant person in another part of the organization who needs to be brought into the fold and start advocating. Um, a lot of the work we do is working with individual collection items. Much more of the work we do is working with individual people to try to build the understanding and the acceptance and the commitment to make accessibility a priority because accessibility helps absolutely everyone. I wanted to add one quick thing um, that could be helpful as a, as a tool really quick as a shout out. And that is that one of the exercises we've done as a part of this work with a lot of organizations is building an inclusive design roadmap. And it's not a schedule. It's simply a sequencing of tasks that considers the resources you're already committing to projects. So imagine you're doing an exhibition next fall, or you have a public program that's going to go live this October, that sort of thing for things that already exist. How how do you use those, those, that existing effort spend, be it people, financial, content, et cetera, to weave in the creation of inclusive design and accessibility standards and practices as part of that work? This way it's not as overwhelming and can be woven into the work you're already doing. So what comes out of an inclusive design roadmap like that is project management tools, things like RACES, where you can know who's responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed that formalizes some of this work. Work, but also things like visual description style guides that reference those controlled vocabularies that was mentioned earlier, or things like exhibition inclusive design and accessibility checklists, or lighting considerations and built environment considerations, digital accessibility evaluations, this kind of stuff. That comes out of this inclusive design roadmap work. And a quick shout out for those of you who do qualify for IMLS funds, there's some great projects out there, happy to talk to you offline about them, where this work can be funded funded to the tune of $250,000 a pop. And so there's good money out there to support this work that doesn't need to take away from operating, which is a great way of having those conversations with senior leadership, because you can go to them not only with a plan and an advocacy, you know, on behalf of accessibility and inclusive design, but also a way of funding this kind of work at the institution, which I think is a, a wonderful thing. Awesome. I'm seeing lots of great comments as you guys are talking about uh, shouting out how appreciative everybody is and how excited everyone is about um, these maturity models um, and various templates and resources that are available. So thank you all for this. Um, this is incredibly useful. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to go ahead and open it up for audience questions. Um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. You can put them below the caption window um, in the speaker track um, that you're looking at. So please feel free to ask some questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started off. 
We've talked a little bit, and Wendy touched on this briefly as well, about making sure that you have leadership buy-in. Um, what are kind of some overall suggestions or advice that all of you have um, for kind of navigating and actually achieving that leadership buy-in if you are facing pushback or you know you can't kind of get um, the right people with enough authority on board for some of these um, initiatives? I have some thoughts on that. Please. Good, because I was going to start with, we have people who love accessibility. <laughs> so, the most helpful um, way to say problems. We, we like to meet people where they are, right? So when we're talking with um, the chief operating officer of a multi-trillion dollar converse, uh, you know, organization, it's a very different conversation than the director of a nonprofit. It's a very different conversation than with a senator or when you know doing legal work for the Supreme Court, that sort of thing. So we have to first understand our audience, right? And if your leadership is interested in financial or re returns like this or key uh, performance indicators and returns on investment in a for-profit venture, uh, even if it's a, a museum, right, those those considerations still come up, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about those numbers like 25% of the population. Let's talk about dwell time, visitation, repeat visitation, discretionary income amongst persons with disabilities that's north of $600 billion in the U.S. alone and multiple trillions of dollars around the world. Let's talk about things like the PR. Um, we've gotten $8 million of earned PR revenue just by commissioning an exhibition by blind photographers and the accessibility we work we did to make those photographs accessible through touch, through sound, and through enhanced tactile visual descriptions. That was $8 million of earned PR revenue that the Canadian Museum for Human Rights got for doing accessibility work. This work doesn't only pay for itself, it is incredibly lucrative and it is incredibly beneficial. But if you're not interested in the financials, maybe your senior leadership is interested in uh, um, return on institutional objectives, then link your arguments against the strategic plan of your organization. Read that strat plan and go bullet by bullet and find out what those objectives are that the institution has committed to and you will always find a linkage in accessibility, access work, and inclusive design work against that strap plan. And then if you're needing to convince people, because maybe the argument is something like, and I've heard this before by prestigious organizations that shall not be named, well, blind people don't come here anyways, said the leader of one of the world's most famous art museums, then what do you do with that, right? Well, then there's some education required, whether that's advocacy work, whether that's bringing in persons with disabilities whom you must pay because there's a lot of uh, labor issues, especially for disabled folks. So making sure you, you give honoraria to people who you're asking for their time but to bring in that awareness and get people on the same page about why this work matters, not to make it view like this requirement or to beat them up over what they've been doing wrong before. This is a journey. All of us are on a different part in that journey, but we need to get people unquestionably and unwaveringly going in the same direction down that road, even if we're going there at different rates of speed. So these are some of the tactics that have been helpful in a variety of those conversations. And if oftentimes the aspirational motivators aren't what's going to motivate your uh -huh. individual audience, lots of our audiences who are hesitant about committing to accessibility in one way or another are afraid of risks, of opening up our organizations to risks. If we're, we say we're going to do something and we don't do it right, we're making it riskier. Or we know that that would be good, but it doesn't really apply to us because we don't have those people. So why would we risk doing this huge thing for nobody to use? Um, when we talk about that, we point out that choosing to have something be inaccessible is choosing to exclude the people who need that to be accessible. You may not currently have somebody who needs a particular product to be accessible, but if you choose that, you're saying all the people coming down the path later who might need that to be accessible are just never going to be able to do it. Um, whether that's using a particular software at, on a desktop or being able to read a display in a hallway. Um, so talking about the reputational and institutional risks 
of choosing to exclude people has power with some audiences. I agree with everything that's been said. If I can add two more points to the topic. One is um, having done this in a number of different organizations, I, I truly believe you can only be fully accessible at, at the level you have a leader who is willing to support it. It's very, very hard to just do accessibility from the bottom up. Um, it's not that it's there's not value there. It's just very hard to be comprehensive. So sometimes if you have to um, and don't have full senior leadership buy-in, picking someone who does have some responsibility like a collection or a particular exhibit who does buy in and does understand the value and really working with them to create kind of a best of, of breed situation that demonstrates the value is, is one way to start to um, affect hearts and minds and, and kind of shift people and how they're thinking about accessibility. Um, and I just also want to add one tactic I didn't hear mentioned that I have found very effective, at least in the digital realm, is to um, give people the experience of what it's like to interact with their content from the point of view of a screen reader or from the point of view of someone who uses a magnifier or some other perspective, because often I feel like um, people don't completely understand what's being lost. And so if, if you all of a sudden look at your site from a different person's perspective, there's this often an aha moment that really helps to change how people think about things. So that's just another strategy that may be a little easier to implement than bringing people in with, with disabilities right off the bat as you're starting these conversations. Awesome, thank you all for those tips. Um, Again, furiously note-taking as all of you are talking because this is really, really helpful. Um, we did have one question from the audience. Um, what about some suggestions for generating good alt text for a multi-image object, uh, like a 200 image folder of letters and photographs? There's, there's a couple of things you can do there. So the question, I just want to make sure we're clear, is about multiple images of the same object. Is that is that correct? I just want to make sure we're talking about the same same thing first. I'm I'm reading this as multiple images, um, like in a slideshow or something mm -hmm. of like a diary or an archival sure. folder filled sure. with different kinds of letters and photographs. Okay. Um, how do you kind of how can you make that more? So there's a lot to unpack there. So we'll, we won't do a deep dive here, but happy to talk offline a little bit. But first of all, when we talk about images of text, we need to make sure we understand that 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 you know that's a deeply inaccessible way for text to be stored. But this is the reality we live in because we're digitizing handwritten or printed material. So the first thing is to make sure we hold on to as good of a quality of the image of the original material as possible, because automated techniques get better every every few years with machine learning, AI techniques, and others to extract more and more information out of these images. So that's important. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, we can run tools like OCR, Applications Optical Character Recognition. That's the ability of a computer to recognize text, right? Um, and we can then extract that text out of these images. But that's not oftentimes sufficient. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the intent? What is the design intent, the usage intent of these objects? Is it for scholarship? In which case that we need to make sure our visual descriptions of those objects include things like the state of the object. Is it tattered? Is it yellowed? What is the characteristics of the font that is used? If it's handwriting, what are some of those you know, specific details? These would be great uh, components for some of these crowdsourcing approaches, right? But then we also have to be thinking about if we've got multiple images of the same object, how are these gonna be surfaced? Are they gonna go online? Are they gonna go in like an iPad application? Are they gonna go in some kind of searchable content management system or digital asset management system that will then coalesce these images and offer them up depending on whatever device is requesting them like an iPhone versus a website? Those things matter and the reason that they matter is because because then sometimes it's appropriate to have a single visual description um, for these particular objects, but then other times it's more appropriate to have a visual description per each image of the object. And we only get to that answer and to that best practice by thinking through these use cases and developing those resources that were mentioned earlier, like a visit, visual description guidelines or visual description style guide, so that you have practices for this. It's not going to be the same answer for these series of letters than it would be for a sculpture, than it would be for a painting or another 2D 
uh, object. And then the last thing I'll mention is let's not forget that also in addition to somebody, for example, like myself using a screen reader, we want to make sure that these resources are available and accessible to audiences that may have different color uh, uh, requirements or zoom requirements. So those high fidelity images are not only helpful for computers down the road in terms of recognition, they're also helpful to allow people to zoom in on it and magnify for their preferences or even invert the colors to make their readability uh, more enhanced. So those are a, a couple of techniques and a couple of things to be thinking about when dealing with a project like that. Perfect. Rochelle, did you have a comment as well? Um, I, I really do agree that so much of it depends on context, but also just wanted to add um, when you think about complicated graphics, a lot of times um, the best thing to do is to provide some kind of textural alternative. So we're working on a project right now for floor plans because those are complex. Um, visualizations of any type are complex. And so you have to ask, you know, what is the purpose? If, if you put for example, a workflow chart or a visualization up in, in a situation, it, you either are intending someone to explore the data or you're intending them to get some kind of point and how you handle describing it is going to depend on that purpose. And thinking about when you write or you create presentations or web pages or however you're serving up that content, writing without that image in front of you and creating alternative text and, and descriptions without that in front of you is really valuable. And I want to go back to something that Sina said earlier. Other people beyond screen reader users benefit from descriptions of complicated images. People with different cognitive disabilities also benefit. People who don't have an image load benefit. And so really asking yourself, if I'm creating this description, is it also beneficial for others? And should I not put it in the alt text? Should I put it in text directly mm -hmm. visible for other people? It's, it's a really important thing to keep in mind. Wow, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. So I appreciate that, Rochelle. Um, the last question that we have time for um, is just uh, a simple one here, hopefully, um, for uh, Wendy and Rochelle is, can you guys define maturity for us in relation to maturity model? Sure. And in this case, it's really how developed uh, is your program? How far along a scale uh, from from really not having thought about accessibility at all to um, moving through to uh, being very uh, deliberate about your accessibility to be able to repeat results to having it integrated throughout your organization. And then finally, um, in the most mature, using that word, uh, instance where not only is your organization conducting accessibility in a, in a really robust fashion, but you're also affecting the larger community as a whole. And so it's, it's that, um, level of integration of accessibility into and inclusion uh, into your organization. Perfect. Um, and I am uh, I am changing my mind a little bit because we did get one more question that we're going to squeeze in here, you guys. Um, a little bit of a follow up to the first question about multi image documents. Um, what about um, for a book? Is that different? Um, than creating description for illustrations and the charts in the books. I guess they were, I think they're referring to the text of the book. Images of the text of the book or an image of the book, which then has implied numbers of pages of things. Um, I think they're saying the text of the book, OCR for a book is different than creating descriptions for the illustrations on the charts in the books. How would you sort of go about navigating that? I'm happy to chime in on that one. Please. Um, so when we talk about books, uh, there are some some best practices with respect to how books can be encoded in digital formats. Uh, a format that everyone should be familiar with is EPUB, E-P-U-B, uh, especially the latest version of EPUB has support for MathML and due to some technologies that I was really fortunate to co-invent with uh, amazing human beings like Neil Soifer, um, now uh, blind folks have the ability to access mathematics online uh, through the use of something called Math Player. So when you use formats like EPUB, you get these accessibility wins because it uses the web semantics that are available to us that we've been talking about via HTML, WCAG, and all of these considerations. Um, you can have accessible PDFs, but PDFs are uh, deeply problematic, both at the technical level, at the standards level, and at the access level for millions of persons with disabilities. And so having alternative formats and uh, far better formats like EPUB goes a long way for having books be accessible. Now, 
Now, if your book is available in some kind of electronic form, even if it's not ideal for distribution, using that as your canonical source of truth for the text of the book is deeply important, so we're not relying on OCR if we don't have to, especially given the errors that can come up. But also because when you do OCR, unless if you're putting a lot of work into your OCR pipeline, you're not going to get the semantics translated correctly. Things like headings, tables, and as you mentioned in the question, charts, graphs, and things of this nature. So when we talk about that, we need to break apart the problem into the book and as in, in terms of how it's going to be encoded into a format, then the text and the accessibility, those are all, let's lump that under document accessibility, and then the visual descriptions of the individual images, as well as the decision to be made on whether certain things don't just get a visual description, they don't just get alt text, but they also get representation such as MathML, or there's a technology called SVG, scalar vector, uh, scale vector, vector graphics, I'm sorry, I can't speak today, um, it, that will make that more accessible. And there's technologies such as ARIA, A-R-I-A, that can be used in order to enhance the accessibility of electronic publications. If, just perchance, the question was about the image of the book, then, of course, we want to follow a visual description best practice, talking about the binding, the visual appearance, making sure we announce any text that is in the image, and talking about any lighting or positioning of the book as is appropriate for whatever level of fidelity your, your visual description best practices dictate. Thank you, Sina. Um, and thank you, Wendy and Rochelle and all of you in our audience that tuned in and commented and asked questions today. Um, I hope, uh, I know that I feel like I learned a lot today. I hope all of you learned a lot today and are walking your way with a lot of great resources and insight into how to kind of go about digital accessibility um, at your institution. Um, please feel free to review the resources we shared, reach out to our panelists with any further questions um, and good luck. Um, remember that we're all responsible for this um, and it's a matter of will, not necessarily budget as uh, Sina mentioned to us in our up for this panel. So thank you all. Thank you, panelists, and uh, everyone have a wonderful Thursday. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye, all.